So today we will go through the study titled Genealogy from Shem to Abraham and the reference verse comes from Genesis chapter 11. And the reference material for the study comes from the book, The Genesis Genealogies, written by Reverend Abraham Park. Um, and you can find the content of the study in chapter 11, page 113 to 168. So this is the overview for the study today. We will be going through three key topics. The first is the outline of Genesis from Shem to Abraham. Secondly, we will go into the details of the genealogy of Shem to Abraham. And lastly, the transmission of faith. And as mentioned just now, the scripture reading comes from Genesis chapter 11, verse 10 to 32. So um, let's uh, do a quick recap. So in our first lesson for the Old Testament survey, Pastor Sam did an introduction to the Old Testament where he talks about the plot and the theme of the Old Testament. So we learn that God built this world and he built the cosmic temple where he will be present and where he will be worshipped. And in it, he put the likeness and the image of God that represent mankind. So here in this story, God is the good guy, right? And we have uh, Satan, which is the bad guy. And in between, there is the human being, which is each and every one of us. And in this drama, mankind rebel against God. So Adam fall, and because of Adam's fall, God subjected all creation to bondage. However, in the midst of that, God offered hope that there will be restoration in the end, which is the whole process, which is known as the history of redemption. And according to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, God says that he promised a restoration through a seed of the woman. So now, human being is either the collective seed of the woman or the collective seed of the serpent. So this conflict will continue on until that single seed, which is the Messiah, which will come and crush the serpent's head. So, so far we have looked at two genealogies, right? The first is the line of Seth. The second is the line of Cain. So would you be able to identify where does these two genealogy sits in this story? So the line of Seth is the seed of the woman, yes. And the line of Cain is the seed of the serpent. So through the genealogy which we will be going through today, which is Genesis 11, we will see the covenantal flow of the seed of God, which is the seed of the woman. And here God will show us the transmission of faith and how his covenant is being passed down from Adam all the way to Abraham. Okay, so, oops, okay. So two weeks ago, we learned about genealogy from Adam to Noah, which is in Genesis 5. So the second part of the genealogy from Shem to Abraham, this continues on in Genesis 11. So in Genesis 11, Shem was the chosen one among the three sons of Noah to lead the work of redemption. So through this study, we will examine the lives of all these patriarchs and see the transmission of faith from Shem all the way to Abraham. And as we know, Abraham is known as the father of faith today. So first, let us just uh, look at the outline of Genesis chapter 11 from Shem to Abraham. So we did the same thing with Genesis 5. Uh, so today we will do the same thing with Genesis 11, where we will list out the names of the patriarchs, and then we will list out the age where they begot the first children, how long they live, and after that we do a calculation of when they die. So, um, so I will just write down the name first. Sorry, let me change. Okay. Shem. Afashan. Shela. Oops. Eber. Pelek. Ru. Seru. Naho. Terra and Abraham, okay? So I will just, um, so you can turn to Genesis 11 as your reference. So according to Genesis 11, um, chapter 11, verse 10 to 11, it says that Shem begot Afashat at 100 years old and he lived another 500 years. So in total, he lived 600 years old. 
So Afashat, according to Genesis chapter 11, verse 12 to 13, he begot Shelah at the age of 35, and he lived another 403 years. So he lived a total of 438 years. Shelah, according to Genesis chapter 11, verse 14 to 15, he lived 30 years, and he begot Eber, and he lived another 400. And he lived another 403 years, and in total, he lived 433 years. Eber, according to Genesis 11, chapter 16 to 17, he lived um, 34 years, and uh, he had Pelek, and he lived another 430 years, so he lived a total of 464 years. Pelek, according to Genesis 11, chapter 18 to 19, he lived 32. Uh, he lived 30 years, and Pelek. Um, live another 209 years. So in total, he lived 239 years. So Pelek, um, Pelek have Ru. So Ru, according to Genesis chapter 11, verse 20 to 21, um, he had uh, Sarok at the age. He have uh, he had uh, Ru at the age of. Uh, uh, Sarah at the age of 32, and then he lived another 207 years. So in total, he lived 239 years. So according to Genesis chapter 11, verse 22 to 23, so Sarah has Nahor at the age of 30, and then he lived another 200 years. So he lived total of 230 years. And Nahor, according to Genesis 11, um, Verse 24 to 25, he lived 29 years, and then he had Terah, and he lived another 119 years, and he died at the age of 148. And Terah, according to Genesis 11, verse 26 to 27, and verse 32, he had Abraham at the age of 70, and then he lived another 135 years, so total he lived 205 years. And finally, Abraham, according to Genesis chapter 21, verse 5 and 25, verse 7, he lived 100 years, and then he had Isaac, and he lived another 75 years. So in total, he lived 175 years. And the reason why we are listing this down right now, because we will be using this outline for our study later. So let's move on to the second part of the study, where we will look into details of genealogy from Shem to Abraham. Okay, so we will start with generation 11, which is Shem. And no one named his son Shem, meaning name or reputation, with the hope that God's name will be widely known through Shem. And according to Noah's expectation, Shem become a person that trusts in God. And this is evident in Genesis chapter 9, verse 27, 26 to 27. Here it says that he also say, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and may Canaan be, in, be his servant, and God enlarge Japheth, may he live in the tents of Shem, and may Canaan be his servant. So here it tells us that Canaan was one of Ham's offspring, and Canaan received the curse of being a servant of Shem. And of Japheth, it says that it was it says that he will be enlarged. And the meaning of that, it implies that he will have material blessings. And when we take into the account of the word where God says that Japheth will dwell in the tent of Shem. Normally, you will dwell in a place where someone that is more powerful. For example, when we go to work, we work for someone that is, that is more powerful or more, have more wealth than us. So this also implies that when Japheth dwell under the tents of Shem, it means that Japheth, uh, it means that Shem not only received the spiritual blessing of the God of Shem, he also received the material blessing as well. Therefore, as we, as we look through the life of Shem, it is our prayer that everyone here will live and glorify the name of God so that everyone here will receive the blessing of Shem as well. Man. So let's move on to 12th generation, which is Afashat. So Afashat in Hebrew, his name means boundary or territory. So after the flood, Shem observed the devastated earth and hoped for the boundary of faith to be established. And he hoped that his blessing and 
the spiritual boundaries that, that he has will be passed down through the future generation, and which is his son, Afashad. So what does it mean to be in the boundary of God? Let's turn to Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 6. It tells us that, For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his own possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. And according to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, it says that, But you are a chosen race, a holy a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So being in the boundary of God means that to be set apart as God's own possession means that we, you are the chosen race, that you are the royal priesthood, and you are the one that he has proclaimed to be called out of the darkness into his light. Therefore, please believe that as we worship here today, that God is right now establishing his boundary in this place, in your hearts and also in your homes as well. Okay. So, um, so let's look at the outline again that we just now that, that we draw out. Do you see something odd between Shem and Afashat? If you look at the numbers. So if you look at here, the lifespan is reduced, right? The numbers of year is reduced. So what could happen that caused this lifespan reduction? And we know that between Shem and Apashat, there was a flood. And this is written in Genesis chapter 7, 11, which tells us that the, um, on the 600 years of Noah's life, the, all the fountains of the deep burst forth and the flood happened. Then another important question. So what happened after the flood that caused a reduction to human lifespan? So there are two things that happened after the flood. First, there was a climate change. Secondly, there was a topographical change. So let's look at the climate change first. So according to Genesis chapter 8, verse 22, it gives us the details of the climate after the flood. So it says that while the earth remained, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, and days and nights shall not cease. So it tells us that the climate before the flood was mild, was a good environment to live in. But after the flood, the climate became extremely hot and cold, and there was winter and there was summer as well. The second change was topographical change. And uh, this is recorded in Psalms chapter 104, verse 6 to 8. So it says that you cover it with a deep sea as with a garment. The water was standing above the mountain. So this is talking about the flood. And when the flood happened, after that, it says that the mountain rose and the valley sank. So the topographical basically changed a lot from, from a flat ground to mountains and sea. So when we look at this, we know that the earth, again, before the flood, was a very good environment to live in with a very good climate. But after that, there was a great topographical change and it causes the living condition on earth to be harsher than it was before the flood. And as a result, human lifespan was reduced. So you must be thinking, how can climate and you know, topographical change affect human health? So I pulled a report that, from Google that shows what is the impact of climate change on human health. So when, when there is a climate change, even topographical change, there will be a lot of factors they change. For example, there is rising temperature, and then there will be more extreme weather, which we talk about, even the Bible said about that, and then the sea temperature will be rising. And all these are the things that we have seen in this world, right? Because there are so many, even young girls are trying to come out and fight for you know, the climate change and you know, asking for people to be more aware of these things. And when all these factors come in, how does it affect um, human health? So we can see that when there's severe weather, there will be more injuries, fatality, mental health, and for example, when there's extreme weather, you will have heat-related illnesses or even death. And when we see topographical change, it gives places for mosquitoes to grow, right, to breed. So those are vector-related diseases. For example, we see malaria, dengue, and Zika that we see previously. So all these are contributing to human health and contributing to a shorter lifespan. 
So, so hence, that is why it explains after the flood why human lifespan was shortened. Okay, so then another important question: Why did the flood happen? Right, because all this was caused by the flood, and why did the flood happen? So, according to Genesis chapter eleven, it tells us that God saw that the earth was corrupted and earth was filled with violence, and God was sorry that he made the earth, and he wanted to destroy it. And according to Psalms chapter 55, verse 23, it says that, but you, God, will bring them down to the pit of destruction. Men of bloodshed and deceit will not live out half their days, but I trust in you. So this verse clearly tells us that if a man is doing <coughs> wicked thing, things, then his, his lifespan will be reduced by half. So we can conclude that the sin of mankind brought about shortening of human lifespan. And according to Proverbs chapter 10, verse 27, it tells us that the fear of law prolongs life, but the years of the wicked will be shortened. So if we sin in front of God, our lifespan will be shortened. And that's, that is why we need to fear and we need to worship God. So if today we are in a place that we are sinning against God, let us repent, let us overcome and live a life that fears and glorify God. Okay. Um, next, I'll move on to the 13th generation, which is Selah. So Selah means to send away, uh, to send, outstretch and sprout. So Afashat begot a son and named him Selah. So in the days of Afashat, if you remember, it says that the boundary of faith will be established. So then it was his hope that, that during the days of Selah, the boundaries of faith will be expanded. And from the Bible, we know that Israel was God's first boundary. However, it was then expanded to the Gentiles and to, to the people of the world according to Jesus' command. And Acts chapter 1 verse 8 tells us what Jesus said about the boundary of faith. And he says that, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witness both in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and even to the remotest part of the earth. Therefore, it is Jesus' command that, just like Selah, we need to stretch out the boundary of faith and be the witness of our Lord Jesus Christ wherever we go. And um, let's move on to the 14th generation. The 14th generation is Eber and means the one who crossed over. And the name Eber was derived from the root word Abba in Hebrew, which means to pass over. And the meaning of his name, it indicates that he crossed over the river Euphrates to pursue the path of faith. So we can see that in Genesis chapter 10, verse 21, it mentioned the name of uh, Eber even before Genesis 11, because right now we are in Genesis 11. But before that, we've seen the name of Eber has already appeared. And it says that also to Shem, the father of all the children of Eber and the older brother of Japheth, children were born. So here it intentionally mentioned the children of Eber. And we know that Shem received the blessing of the God of Shem. And when it, is says, it says that, um, that Shem, the father of all the children of Eber, it means that Shem, that Eber also received the blessing of the God of Shem. So in, in that way, it shows us that Eber has inherited Shem's faith and also he has true and pure faith. Okay, so then why did Eva cross over the river Euphrates? Why did not he just stay there and live happily? So according to Genesis chapter 11, verse 4, so at that time, Ham's descendant, who is Nimrod, was building the Tower of Babel. And they are not just building any tower. They are building this structure, uh, this ziggurat structure, and in the old Mesopotamian day, ziggurat were typically intended to serve as a staircase or a binding location between heaven and earth. That is the, that is the spiritual meaning of this structure. So when they are trying to build this binding location between heaven and earth, it means that what they want to do, they want to have access to heaven. So it means that they are 
directly challenging the authority of God. And Eber, being a godly descendant, Eber departed from Mesopotamia, which is by that time we know that has become the center of idolatry. And he crossed over the river Euphrates and to a place, he traveled around 1,000 kilometers to a place called Aleppo. And this is actually a city in Syria today. So he traveled 1,000 kilometers there. And in fact, there are some historical records that this actually happened. So there was some analysis that was being done on more than 15,000 of tablets that was found near Aleppo. And it was discovered that there was a kingdom called Ebla around 2,300 BC, and the king was Eber, and he was the first king of that kingdom. So Eb the kingdom of Ebla was a very civilized kingdom. The, there was arts, um, there was scholarship, and they are conquering the regions around it. So it shows us that Eber and his ancestor did not participate in the building of Tower of Babel, but they hold on to their faith, they sought the freedom of their faith, they crossed the river Euphrates and established a kingdom called Aleppo. So let us, um, let us be like Eber, that we will have the courage to sort the freedom of our faith and, uh, and uh, leave, leave the place of sin. Okay, um, now we move on to the 15th generation, which is Pelek. So Pelek in Hebrew means division, separate and split. So as uh, Eber has his son, he named him Pelek because he wished that he would be separated from the world, that he will be a holy person that will be dedicated to God. And according to, if we, if we look at Genesis chapter 10, verse 25, it actually testifies that in the days of Pelek, the earth was divided. Um, and for, there's a specific verse that says that in his day, the earth was divided. But what is the reason for this division? Is, is Pelek being separated from the world because he is holy and he's following God's will? Or he is separated because he, there is something else that happened. So there are a few reference verses that tells us what happened. So we will run through this verse. So in Genesis chapter 11, verse 2, it tells us that at this time, Shem descendant moved to the land of Shana. And based on that story of Nimrod, we know that this is the place where the Tower of Babel is being built. So in Genesis chapter 11, verse 3 to 4, it tells us about the construction of the Tower of Babel. And in Genesis chapter 11, verse 9, it talks about how God confused the language of the earth and he scattered the people of the earth because they are building the Tower of Babel. So as a result, the earth is divided in the day of Peleg. So it tells us very clearly that in the days of Peleg, the earth was divided because of sin. So let's now look, let's look through the outline again uh, between Peleg Eber and Pelang, if you look at the lifespan, you will see that it dropped tremendously again here at this point. And we know that Eber lived until 464, but Pelang only lived un until 239. And just now we learned that there is a very close relationship between sin and human lifespan. So this tells us that because of this sin of building the Tower of Babel, God was angry because even the godly children, even Pelek participated in that activity, God shortened their lifespan as a judgment because of this sin. Okay? So therefore, no matter what happened, we must not sympathize and we must not participate with sinful activity, but rather let us be separated so that we will be in a place of holiness. And as written in Psalms chapter 1, verse 1 to 2, blessed is the one who does not walk in the step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinner takes or sit in the place of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. Amen. Uh, next, I'll move on to the 16th generation, which is Ru. So his name means friend and neighbor. So after Eber's death, there was no spiritual leader to provide guidance. So during this unstable time, 
Peleg named his son Ru with the hope that he will have good interpersonal relationship, many friends in the world, so that he can rely on the power of the world. Um, maybe let us do one activity right now. So can you show me your fist? Okay. So can you try to give a rating to your day? So if your day is very bad, it's a zero, it's a fist. But if it's good, you can do a one, two, three, four, five. The five means you have an awesome, super awesome day. So let's do at a count of three, how is your day today? One, two, three. Okay, we see different number. Five, three. Okay, let's try. Let's, let's, let's try one more time. How is your day yesterday? Okay, one, two, three. <laughs> yeah, I was a five today, but I was a one yesterday. Let's try again. How about tomorrow? Would you be able to predict tomorrow? <laughs> one, two, three. Yeah, I think everyone. <laughs> okay, okay. So this, actually, this activity shows us one thing that you can see yesterday, you can see today. It is, uns it is unstable. Our days are just like the days of Ru. It is unstable. Yesterday can be a three, today can be a five, but tomorrow is uncertain. So even in our days today, our lives are uncertain, our lives are unstable. And would we be like Ru as a believer, but we will choose to believe in the world? We will, choose, will we choose to rely on the world when we, our days are zero or our days are bad? Or will we choose to rely on our best friend who is Jesus Christ? So basically, if we want to look for a best friend, we know that there is only one person in this world because there is only one person who will die for us. And that is our Lord Jesus Christ because he has died on the cross so that we are here today. So may we also follow the commandment of our Lord Jesus Christ so that he will recognize us as his friend as well. So as John 15 verse 15 says, no longer do I call you slaves, for the slave do not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends, for all things I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. May we all receive this blessing that we will receive, we will hear directly from our Lord Jesus Christ, every single word that the father has told him. Amen. And next generation, generation 17, which is uh, Sarut. So Sarut means fine shoot, firm strength, and bold. So Ru hoped that his son would possess firm strength in this world. So he named him Sarut. And we know that victory in battle is not dependent on human. It is always dependent on God. And there is so many, so many examples in the Bible that we have seen. When people rely on God, you can just blow a trumpet, you can just get the choir to sing. They will win wars against hundreds of uh, um, armies of, you know, of the other nation. So it tells us that we must not rely on people, but on God who can supply us with amazing strength from above. And let's look at Psalms chapter 146, verse 3 to 5. It says that do not trust, do not put your trust in princess, nor in a son of man, in whom there is no help. His spirit departs, he returns to his earth. In that very day, his plan perish. Happy is he who has God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord his God. So may we always have the God of Jacob the Lord as our help. Amen. So the next generation, uh, generation 18, this uh, Naho. So Naho means to breathe hard, to pant, and to snort. So Naho has the shortest lifespan among all the 10, uh, all the 20 generations within the line of Seth. And this is written in Genesis 11, chapter 24 to 25. He lived only up to 148. And from what we have gathered so far, shorter lifespan has something to do with sin. Therefore, we gather that Naho may have died at an early age because of some kind of disaster or sins that he may have uh, committed. So again, we need to do away with greed, do away with idolatry and sin. And the only reason why we need to pant 
is because we are serving God zealously. 19th generation, uh, Terra. And Terra means to stay or to delay. So according to Genesis chapter 11, verse 31 to 32, God called Abraham to leave the earth of Chaldeans. So Terra set up together with Abraham and they moved to Haran. However, Terah decided to stay in Haran because Haran was such a wonderful environment. So he decided to delay in Haran and he eventually dies there. So Genesis 11 concludes with the death of Terah. And this actually puts an end to the corruption in the godly line of Shem. Because just now we learned that Peleg, Ru, Serok and Nahor, all of them were corrupted even though they were in the line of Shem. Okay, so now we will move to the last generation, which is Abraham. So before he received the name Abraham, his name was Abraham, which means exalted father and honored father. So at the age of 99, God gave him the name Abraham, which means the father of multitude, the father of nations. So Abraham, he received the calling of God from God and he obeyed the calling from God. So he left his home country in the Earl of Chaldeans. He moved to Haran. And then from in Haran, he received a second calling to go to the land of Canaan. But this time it was extremely difficult for him because he is a filial son and he has to leave, he has to leave his father, right? Because you, if you remember, Terah decided to delay. He wanted to stay. So Abraham has to make a decision. He has to leave. So he obeyed the calling from God. He separated himself from his worldly relationship and he went to the land of Canaan. And because of Abraham's obedience, God acknowledged Abraham's faith. And today he received the blessing as the forefather of faith. Okay? So that ends um, the genealogy, um, the de the the details of the genealogy from Shem to Abraham. So we will go into the last uh, part, which is the transmission of faith. So we will now go all the way back to Abraham again. Let's go back to the Garden of Eden. Okay, so Adam. So Adam, he was in the Garden of Eden. He fell and he was banished from the Garden of Eden. And because he fell, Cain killed Abel. And because of that, he was, he was uh, remorseful and he repented. And we know that the core of um, the, the teaching from Adam is repentance and obedience. So Adam lived the remainder of his life teaching about repentance and obedience. Oops. And from Adam, from... The study in Genesis 5, we learn that Adam, in fact, lived together with Lamech for 56 years. So this allowed Adam to trans transmit his faith, his lesson on repentance and obedience, all the way to Lamech. And we know that Lamech was Noah's father. And that is when Noah received this transmission of faith from Adam to Lamech, now to Noah. And Finally, we, leave, we know that Noah lived contemporaneously with Abraham for 58 years. So how do we come about with this 58 years? How do we know about that? So going back to the, to the age um, of when they become father, which we populated earlier. So if we take the age of Noah when he became father, and we add them up all the way up to Terah when he had Abraham. So if we add up this number, it tells us that Terah had Abraham at the age of Noah, 892. So if you add this up together, it tells us that Terah had Abraham at the age of Noah, 892. So we know also that Bible tells us that Noah lived until 950 years old. So when we take 950 minus 892, that is when we are able to get the 58 years. So this also tells us that God allowed Noah to live a very, very long life, all the way up to 950 years, so that he will be able to transmit his faith 
all the way to Abraham. And because of that, Abraham received the faith. He was able to be like Eber. He crossed over the river Euphrates and he entered the land of Canaan. So let us now conclude. So through Genesis 11, we can see that there is a lot of rebellion and there is ceaseless sin within mankind. And, but we can see God's faithfulness and God's zeal to save mankind through the promise of the seed of the woman. And even though the world was filled with sin during the time of Noah, even though God bring judgment of the flood, he set Noah apart. He put them in the ark and he set them apart. And during the time of the construction of Tower of Babel, God set Eber apart, where Eber crossed over river Euphrates and he established the kingdom of Aleppo. And now, even, even up to Abraham, even though he was dwelling in Haran, where it is the center of idolatry, God set him apart so that he can advance his administration of redemption. So right now, God is also doing the same thing. As we are receiving the word of the history of redemption, God is setting us apart to advance his history of redemption as well. So... Our lives is in the hand of our Father, and as we receive this word, may we inherit the faith of Shem, Ham, and Abraham today. May the remainder of our lives be in the hands of our Father, and that he will enable us to fulfill the history of redemption. So may we be able to partake and complete this race of faith that God has prepared for us so that we will be able to enter the eternal rest with our Lord Jesus Christ, just like our forefather of faith. Amen. Let us pray. Dearest Heavenly Father, we truly give thanks to you for this word, Father. Father, we are just so blessed, Father God, to be able to receive this word, to be able to understand your history of redemption, Father God, to be able to understand your mystery, Father, that you have, you have hidden within this Genesis 11, Father. Father, we pray that as we receive this word, Father God, help us to, be, to have the faith, Father, to walk with our Lord Jesus Christ, Father God, so that, Lord, that we will receive all the blessings that our forefather of faith have received all the way from Adam to Abraham, Father. We pray, Father God, that you will allow us the strength, the wisdom, the courage, and the ability, Father, to allow us to march forward and enter into your kingdom of heaven. Father, we give thanks to you once again, and we want to commit everything into your hand, Father, believing, Lord, that you are in full control, and believing, Father God, that you will protect us and guide us until the very end. We give thanks to you, and we pray all this in our Lord Jesus Christ, most precious and holy name of thanksgiving. Amen.